Let's begin the final, the final chapter in our discussion of spontaneous symmetry breaking is spontaneous symmetry breaking in presence of local gauge invariance. In other words, the Higgs phenomenon and everything that is connected to it. As we just discussed uh, offline, um, I will not uh, really discuss here the absolute basics because I know that you uh, know about them from other lectures. So we will not really stress a lot that uh, this is fundamentally important for particle physics and uh, also fundamentally important for superconductors where there is the Higgs phenomenon. Uh, there are no massless Goldstone bosons, but uh, if there is a vacuum expectation value breaking uh, spontaneously such a symmetry, then the gauge bosons associated with the gauge invariance become massive and uh, the Goldstone bosons become unphysical and there are maybe some remnant scalar degrees of freedom corresponding to the vacuum expectation value which can be excited uh, corresponding to the Higgs boson or similar excitation modes in condensed matter physics. So that is all very important and very interesting, but you know that. And here we will discuss a few more detailed aspects which have to do partially with physics and partially with formalisms and which are quite generic and general, independent of concrete models. And uh, there is in parallel the standard model lecture where we discuss, of course, the concrete spontaneous symmetry breaking in the electroweak standard model and its physics implications. And here we will do something complementary and you will see exactly what we will do. So let me first uh, start by uh, saying that there is somehow um, already a difficulty in defining what we mean by spontaneous symmetry breaking in gauge theories because what is a gauge transformation? A gauge transformation is a transformation which does not change physics. It only changes the theoretical variables, the theory description of a physical state, but it does not change the physical state itself. Therefore, what can it mean to say spontaneous symmetry breaking where we would normally mean the vacuum, the ground state is not invariant under a transformation. If the transformation doesn't even change the state at all, there is no way that the vacuum cannot be invariant under that transformation. So therefore, spontaneous symmetry breaking in a gauge theory is already kind of a misnomer. So therefore, let's write this down. It does not change physics. And uh, therefore, in some sense, spontaneous symmetry breaking is meaningless. So what does it, however, mean? Very often, and for example, in the standard model and all the other examples that you know, uh, there is uh, both at the same time local gauge invariance and simultaneously global um, symmetry. simultaneously with local gauge invariance and then that global symmetry can be, uh, can first of all change the state and therefore it can also be spontaneously broken. But in order to quantize a gauge theory we need a gauge fixing and the gauge fixing changes uh, the theory and it also can change the content corresponding to global symmetries. Global symmetries might be broken or might not be broken by the gauge fixing and therefore the fate of global symmetries and therefore their behavior with respect to spontaneous symmetry breaking can depend on the gauge fixing. So this is uh, a forward and uh, from now on we will assume specifically Young-Mills theories where we know exactly the structure so it's not just some arbitrary gauge invariance in the sense of first and second uh, class constraints on the Lagrangian 
but specifically young mills theories and there indeed we do have uh, global symmetry and local symmetry at the same time and we will study what uh, that means. Let us first begin with a discussion of the Goldstone theorem which becomes invalid. As you probably know, or maybe not, but uh, anyway, historically, um, when the Higgs phenomenon was discovered by Higgs and others, the big deal was not so much predict, uh, uh, predicting the Higgs boson, but the big deal was to evade Goldstone's theorem. In other words, keep the nice features of spontaneous symmetry breaking but avoid the existence of massless particles because in nature there were no massless particles except for the photon. Therefore, one could say there cannot be any spontaneous symmetry breaking unless there is a way to evade uh, the existence of Goldstone bosons. And therefore, this was the big deal uh, of the papers by Higgs and uh, Braut, Angler and uh, all the others. And uh, so let us see how one evades the Goldstone theorems because we gave even two proofs of it and somehow uh, the conditions that go into the proof must become invalid if we add local gauge invariance onto our global symmetry. So let us uh, go to the proofs uh, which were done in section 4.4.4 four, 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 or 4.4.5. Four, four, so suppose we do a gauge fixing so that we have a proper quantum theory. And even after gauge fixing, there is a global symmetry. So it's a particular kind of gauge fixing which breaks local gauge invariance but does not break global gauge invariance. And that is not e uh, difficult to achieve. For example, in QED, the ordinary gauge fixing has exactly that property. And uh, therefore, then we can ask this question, what about our field variations in the vacuum? In other words, in this path integral notation, delta phi expectation value at j equals zero which uh, tells us whether the vacuum is invariant under a symmetry transformation. So if this is true, then that was the starting point for our proofs of the Goldstone theorem. And so let us assume that this is exactly what happens. And going through the proof shows that the proof does not become invalid. The proof just goes through as before and we show that there is a number n broken, zero eigenvalues of the two-point uh, function gamma phi phi at p equals zero. So this is an automatic consequence. And so therefore, uh, you might conclude from this that uh, it must mean um, that uh, there are massless particles in the theory. However, in a gauge theory after gauge fixing, it can happen that uh, certain types of particles and certain states are unphysical because they belong to a BRST quartet or because they have negative norm and so on. And then uh, those states do not correspond to physical observables, but they are just uh, in our theory in an unphysical sector. So they might be in unphysical sector. And of course, they actually are in an unphysical sector. If you would really be able to prove uh, such a massless particle, then it must be unphysical, because there is no massless particle associated with such a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And uh, in this way, you invalidate the proof. 
There are other ways. You do not have to choose this gauge fixing which leaves the global symmetry. There are also other ki kinds of gauge fixings. For example, there is unitary gauge. This always exists and uh, how you can um, do it as see in the standard model lecture. So there you simply gauge away the goldstone modes can gauge away, away the goldstone modes before quantization. And then there is uh, no global gauge invariance anymore and uh, therefore no spontaneous symmetry breaking and uh, no proof of Goldstone's theorem. So in this case, there is no massless state at all in the theory, not even in the unphysical sector. In unitary gauge, there actually is no unphysical sector. Everything is physical and uh, there just is no massless state whatsoever in the theory. Then, for example, also, let's put it here, there is RxI gauges. Also see a standard model lecture. So this gauge fixing um, has an unphysical sector, but it breaks global gauge invariance explicitly. So therefore, also there is no starting point for the proof of Goldstone's theorem, and so there are no massless states in the theorem. So for example, in the standard model, the gauge fixing uh, contains this term, 1 over 2 psi w for the w boson, uh, d mu w plus minus uh, oh, let's do it for the Z, Z boson, D mu Z uh, plus MZ times the neutral Goldstone boson square. And then you see the Z boson is singled out explicitly and the neutral Goldstone boson is singled out explicitly, but under global SU2 transformations, the neutral Goldstone would have to transform into the charged Goldstone and into the normal Higgs. But in the gauge fixing, the Higgs doesn't appear, only the Goldstone appears and therefore this SU2 global invariance is explicitly broken by this gauge fixing. And so then you do not have a starting point for Goldstone's theorem and therefore if you look at this uh, globally, then uh, no matter what you do, you can do many different things, but uh, uh, in all cases um, the Goldstone theorem does not apply in the sense that there is no physical massless particle that uh, somebody could observe. That was one of the discoveries um, of Higgs and uh, the other people working on this topic in the 1960s. Let us now um, study in a little bit formal detail the structure of all the relevant masses in a spontaneously broken Young-Mills theory. What are the masses of relevance and of interest to us? As you know, most importantly uh, for us today, uh, the vector bosons become massive. And most importantly for the people at the time, the Goldstone bosons become unphysical, even though there might be some massless states inside of the uh, theory. We will look at both. We will look at the masses of uh, the physical gauge bosons, and we will also look at the masses of the unphysical states in our theory, uh, because they correspond to BRST invariance, and they must be connected to each other. Everything that is unphysical must be connected by BRST invariance, and we, we look at both the unphysical and the physical parts of our theory. I use that uh, first of all because I think it is important uh, to understand this general structure to see the fundamental correctness and validity of this kind of theories. 
um, but I also use it a little bit to teach you more um, how you can actually apply these Slavnov Taylor identities in practice in order to extract maybe interesting physics information. So let us look at the general structure. of the self-energies of all these relevant fields and states. And self-energies, of course, give information on the masses. So we assume a Young-Mills theory with scalars. So the fields are A, A mu, C A, C bar A, B A. This is the list of fields that we need for our BRST formalism to work. So all of this is necessary in order to correctly describe um, the quantization of gauge bosons. And then we have, in addition, scalars. I will call them small h i. And this is some number of scalar fields. And for simplicity, we assume here that they are all real scalar fields. Uh, that is no loss of generality because you can decompose a complex field into two real components. So that is what we assume, and fermions do not matter for this discussion. Then we assume um, a BRST invariant uh, gauge fixing plus ghost term. And we do not actually care how they look like in detail. Our results will hold in general. And so anyway, what follows from this is a Slavnov taylor identity, which I write like we did it recently, gamma star, uh, gamma star gamma, which is a shorthand notation for this, an integral over space-time coordinate x times d gamma derivative with respect to a source ki times d gamma derivative with respect to a field phi i integrated over the coordinates x. And so the fields phi i here, they run over all the fields of our theory, a mu, c, c bar, b, and h. And these are the sources for the BRST transformations S of all the corresponding fields, such that a derivative, precisely this derivative, uh, extracts the BRST transformation of the corresponding field at three level, and at higher orders, it corresponds to some uh, loop-corrected expectation value of such a composite operator. Let us now use the slavnov taylor identity to extract consequences on self-energies, on two-point functions. How can we use that to extract information on concrete two-point functions, such as the gauge boson self-energy, giving us information on the gauge boson mass? Or how can we get information on the Higgs self-energy, giving information on the Higgs mass? That is possible by taking further functional derivatives of this identity, zero is equal to that. If we take a functional derivative, then we get zero still on the left-hand side. And here, we get second derivatives of gamma with respect to something. And the second derivative of gamma corresponds to a self-energy. So then we get relationships between self-energies. Therefore, let's do that. And the general structure is that concrete slavnov taylor identities are obtained by taking functional derivatives with respect to some fields of the slavnov taylor identity, set and then setting all the fields to zero. And uh, so let me show you how that works. Example, let me take zero is equal to the second derivative with respect to, um, what do we take, for example, a um, Fadiev Popov ghost, CA, and a Nakanishi Lautrup field, BB. And we do that of this whole Slavnov-Taylor identity. 
so of this object. What happens if we extract that and set all the fields to zero? So what is going to happen is that we get here an x integral and then we get second derivatives. For example, we get a term where we get a second derivative, gamma derivative with respect to ca times um, source ki times a derivative gamma derivative with respect to b and with respect to the field phi i where we have a sum over all the possible fields phi i. And if we set all the fields to zero, then this really corresponds to a one particle irreducible green function. And now you have to think which non -part, uh, one particle irreducible green functions can actually be non-zero. Only those ones can be non-zero where things like ghost number is preserved, Lorentz invariance is preserved, and so on. So for example, you cannot have a one particle irreducible green function from an Akanishi Lautrup field to a ghost field because that would violate ghost number conservation. Also, you cannot have, uh, what else can you not have? You could not have uh, one a green function from an Akanishi Lautrup field to a fermion field, to an electron field, because that would violate Lorentz invariance and so on. You can, however, have a green function from a ghost to an anti ghost. And most of these sources here have anti-ghost number, and so therefore you can have a 1pi green function from a ghost to uh, one of those sources here. That is possible. And then you could also have a green function from an akanishi lautrup field to another one, or to a gauge boson, or to a Higgs field, because these are two bosons and there can be a green function between two bosons. So there are some terms which work and some terms which cannot work. There are also some other possibilities, like for example, you could do uh, just the first derivative with respect to a source only, and then applying three derivatives onto this sort of thing. Then both additional derivatives act onto the second factor here. And then you have here a one-point function times a three-point function. And then again, you can ask, which one point function can be zero, that would be a one PI diagram with one external source and nothing else. All these sources have non-vanishing ghost number and there cannot be a one point function where just non-vanishing ghost number goes in and nothing goes out. Therefore, all these green functions are zero. Here also, you can go through all the possibilities uh, and all of them violate ghost number. So phi runs through all these possibilities and then, uh, okay, all of them except for one would violate ghost number, but uh, you can see that all possibilities here vanish. So therefore, there are not many terms out of all these possible sums distributing the new derivatives and summing over the i, which can actually give a non-zero value. Can somebody from you tell me one term, uh, one concrete field phi i and ki, which gives a non-zero result, or potentially a non-zero result, which is not obviously zero. Can somebody say one example term which could contribute here, which corresponds really to one PI green functions which really can exist? Imagining going with phi i, go through all these possibilities and looking, for example, at this term. So if you put here phi to A, then you have here ghost and the source for A and B and A. Can that be non-zero? Can be non-zero. Ghost, then you would have here B ghost. Can that be non-zero? Anti-ghost, not B. Then you would have here BB and here C and the source for B. Could it be non zero? Principle, maybe yes. Higgs, 
could also be non-zero. Okay, so let us now write down, after thinking a little bit, there are precisely three terms which can be non-zero and all the other terms must automatically be zero without any calculation. And so we get an identity, zero is equal to the following, um, gamma derivative with respect to C A, K, how do I want to write it, H I times gamma B B H I. So we have set phi to the Higgs field plus gamma C A K A mu C times gamma B B A mu C plus gamma there is another possibility which looks different from the above. BB times K C bar C times gamma C A C bar C. These are precisely the only three possible terms which can be potentially non-zero. And let me write down arguments we can do it in position space, but we can also Fourier transform and do it in momentum space. And then the x integral simply means momentum conservation. Then we have here a momentum for the ghost incoming p, then minus p, and then here again minus p and p, then momentum is conserved. Here as well p minus p, minus p and p. And here also p minus p arguments minus p and P. Okay, then let us do another one. That is our Slavnov Taylor identity one. A second Slavnov Taylor identity is obtained by taking the second derivative with respect to a ghost and with respect to a vector field, let's say a new B. In the same way, you can uh, go through the same procedure and you will get almost the same terms as before because actually the uh, gauge boson and the B field, they have the same quantum number, so essentially the same green functions can be non-zero. So let's start writing. So gamma C A K H I times gamma A B in U H I plus gamma C A K A mu C gamma A nu B A mu C. But the third term doesn't exist because uh, we already know precisely what is the source uh, doing of C bar. C bar has the simplest BRS transformation. It transforms into B only and therefore the derivative of B with respect to A would be zero. So this third term has no counterpart here, so we get only a sum of two terms which overall must vanish. Then let's do a third one. We can do a second derivative of the slavnov taylor identity with respect to a ghost and a Higgs field Hj. And you see the logic that I am doing here, I always take one derivative with respect to a ghost and one derivative with respect to one of the bosons. The interesting bosons are the Higgs, the gauge bosons, and the nakanishi laudrup auxiliary field. And so then the structure is always the same because all the bosons have the same quantum numbers. So I get again the same copy of equations where just the A is replaced by the Higgs field or the scalar field. Gamma C A K H I, gamma H J H I. So that would be a Higgs self energy plus gamma C A K A C mu, gamma H J A C mu. Okay, and so you see hopefully now that the Slavnov Taylor identities that we have produced in this way constrain all the relevant self energies. So here, there is the Higgs self-energy, which contains the Higgs masses, and also the Goldstone masses, which would be zero if we wouldn't have um, local gauge invariance. 
uh, somewhere we have the gauge boson self-energy, which gives rise to the gauge boson masses, which would be zero in the unbroken case and non-zero in the broken case. And then there are lots of other terms, mixing terms, and you know already such mixing terms from the discussion of the arc psi gauge, because there appear such mixing terms between scalars and vector bosons automatically. If you have spontaneous symmetry breaking and these arc psi gauges make them vanish due a cl clever choice of the um, gauge fixing um, function, but in general there can be such mixing terms between Higgs and gauge bosons and also between B field and gauge bosons and also between B fields and Higgs bosons. All of that can in principle appear. And all of that is constrained by these three identities. And now I want to really evaluate the consequences of the combination of these three identities and derive basically all the consequences that you know from this formalism. And then some of the consequences will hold at all orders, some of the consequences will hold at three level and I will tell you why. In general you should be aware of the following thing. Uh, the spontaneous symmetry breaking for global symmetries has rigorous theorems which are non-perturbative, namely the Goldstone theorem. This case here has no such rigorous uh, non-perturbative theorems and so some statements can be derived in perturbation theory at three level and then there are some higher order corrections and some other um, relationships can be derived at all orders but in general the discussion is not uh, as um, let's say generic as in the global case. So for example, there would not be a non-perturbative theorem that the gauge boson masses must be massive. Uh, that is, however, a perturbative statement which can be derived at three level. And uh, as long as the higher order corrections are small, the statement of course survives. But there is no non-perturbative counterpart of that statement. So I want to show you how you can really make sense of this identity and how you can evaluate it in practice. And in order to do it, we should um, get some analytical understanding of the structure of the self-energies. For example, they have Lorentz structures. The gauge boson self-energy has a transverse part and the longitudinal part, and you imagine that the transverse part is physical, the longitudinal part is unphysical, and so on. This, for example, has one Lorentz index, so if it depends on a momentum P, the result will be proportional to P nu, because there is no other way. This here as well has one Lorentz index, so it will be proportional to P mu. And about some other quantities we know nothing, and some other quantities we know precisely, and so let us evaluate what we know, and then simplify the uh, structure of these identities. And maybe actually let me do it on a new blackboard so that this will become a nice table. So the photon or uh, gauge boson self energy A mu A A nu B uh, I times that with momentum p comma minus p. That really means this thing, the one pi green function with uh, momentum p flowing in this direction and here we have the index a b. And the result of this has two Lorentz indices and it depends on the momentum so and it, uh, we can factor out an i and then we can write it by projection operators on the one hand minus g mu nu plus p mu p nu over p square times a transverse part a b which can then only depend on p square minus p mu p nu divided by p square times a longitudinal part a b which also can only depend on p square and then we have done a covariant decomposition 
of uh, the gauge boson self-energy. And we either in some identities only the longitudinal or only the transverse part will appear and that is of interest. There is one uh, additional thing to notice. The covariant decomposition has a singularity at p square equals zero but by construction such 1pi diagrams cannot have a singularity at p square equals zero. Therefore, if we apply a regularity at p square equals zero condition, then we see that uh, this thing can only be regular at p square equals zero if at p square equals zero the transverse and longitudinal form factors are the same. So transverse at zero must be equal to the longitudinal form factor also at zero. Otherwise there would really be a one over p square singularity which cannot appear uh, in perturbation theory anyway. Okay, so next, the Higgs self-energy or scalar self-energy, gamma h i h j p minus p, that is of course this one p i green function from scalar i to scalar j with momentum p flowing in that direction. And here uh, there is nothing else we need to do. This is uh, scalar and it's uh, simple enough. However, what we can say is uh, what do we know about this at tree level? At tree level we know something about this because this comes of course from um, the Lagrangian. This is the effective action, so this comes from the Lagrangian and uh, in the Lagrangian we have a Young-Mills theory, there are kinetic terms for the scalars and therefore at tree level this must be i times p square times Kronecker delta ij if the scalar fields are normalized in the ordinary way. Then we have this plus a mass term plus higher order corrections. Okay, so we know maybe nothing about the higher orders. We know nothing about the mass term, but we know this about the kinetic term. And that might come in handy. Then, next, gamma h i a mu a p minus p. So this would be a, such a mixing object where we start with a scalar. The momentum flows in this direction and we end up with a vector. Here, as I said, the result must depend on a momentum for vector p mu. And we can simply write it as p mu times a form factor which can then only depend on p square. The only question is how do we normalize it? We normalize it with an i times p mu uh, times gamma h a i a of p square. And then we have here a scalar form factor which we can make use of. So this is the most important thing, then a little bit of additional information. For example, we know the BRST transformation of the gauge bosons. Do you know the gauge BRST transformation of the gauge boson? No? Yes. Normal d mu or covariant d mu? Is there a difference? Um, no, it's the covariant, yeah, plus additional terms uh, in, in uh, Finally, this is the covariant derivative, but let's just say it like this. And uh, because that is sufficient. So that is sufficient for us now. And the BRST transformation of the anti-ghost is of course the B field. And uh, if you know that, then we know the following, namely I times gamma C B K A A mu of p comma minus p. Uh, let's leave some space here and let us evaluate this at tree level. What is this at tree level? At tree level, I take the effective action and I derive with respect to k a mu. The derivative with respect to that source by definition leads to the BRST transformation of a. So that derivative gives exactly this. Then we take another derivative with respect to the ghost 
and then we get the prefactor, which is the derivative. But we have passed to momentum space. In momentum space, a derivative becomes minus i times the incoming momentum. Therefore, that thing is exactly minus i times p mu. And then times Kronecker deltas between those things. So at three level, we get minus and times i gives plus p mu times Kronecker delta ac. Okay. That is precisely the result. And therefore, let us in general write the ansatz p mu that must appear times some function which we call capital D A C of P square. And then we, uh, that is completely general, but we already know at three level this capital D is Kronecker delta. So this D is invertible at P square equals zero in the matrix sense. Then next, gamma B B K C bar A. Let's leave out the i here. So the derivative with respect to kc bar gives the BRST transformation of that which is b itself. Therefore, this also gives delta ab. And that is exact since b has no interactions. So in general, it would there would be higher order corrections for 1pi diagrams between these two, but since B has no interactions, there cannot be 1pi diagrams correcting it, and therefore this three-level result is exact. So what else? And maybe most important, gamma C A K H I. What does that mean? Let's give it a name, d a i of p squared. This is a scalar quantity. Let's call it d a i. And what does it mean? The derivative with respect to k h i gives us the BRST transformation. In other words, the gauge transformation of a scalar field. And that gives us then really the gauge transformation in the gauge direction a. Uh, and if that derivative is non-zero, then it means the gauge transformation of the Higgs in direction A is a constant. What does it mean if the gauge transformation of some scalar field is a constant and not field dependent? It is spontaneous symmetry breaking. That is exactly the thing that in the vacuum this field transforms into a vacuum expectation value. So this, is, this would be order parameter for spontaneous breaking of the symmetry. If that is non-zero, then we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. So let's say, just as a reminder, delta phi in the vacuum is non-zero. And here, that corresponds precisely to d a i at zero doesn't vanish. And so, as always, the rank of this matrix would count the number of spontaneously broken directions. So we have identified our, um, let's say, parameter which governs the spontaneous breaking. We have listed um, all our decompositions for the relevant green functions. And we have three slavnov taylor identities. And for this reason, I think we can now simplify the slavnov taylor identities and write them down in terms of those simpler quantities. Let's do it. And uh, actually, this is a little bit tedious, I have to say. I did it, of course. And uh, we can do it together. But basically, you need to look uh, at all the blackboards and collect uh, all the ingredients. So for example, for the first identity, we see here this object. That becomes our D our measure for spontaneous symmetry breaking. So we have here 0 is equal to d a i. 
of p square times that we have not introduced an abbreviation for this one b b h i we have introduced an abbreviation for this one that was this p mu times capital d a c we have not introduced an abbreviation for this one so minus i p so i will write it a little bit from my notes and just tell you uh, basically where it comes from d a c of p square times gamma b b a c mu and then we have this which we have evaluated exactly Kronecker delta and uh, then this is unchanged so plus gamma c a c bar b and I took great care that here all the signs are correct and so on so let's go to the next case the next slavnov taylor identity over there it begins in the same way it begins with our da dai of p square by the way all the arguments otherwise are unchanged dai of p square then the next is this object for which we have introduced this covariant decomposition so we get p mu times something then uh, finally we have a product of that object which also contains p mu times the gauge boson self energy so then in the second line all terms are proportional to p mu we can cancel the p mu and uh, leave it out of the equation and then we simply obtain this times gamma h a i b of p square minus d a c of p square times the longitudinal part of the gauge boson self energy with index bc and why longitudinal because the gauge boson self energy was multiplied with this p mu coming from the prefector and so this uh, kills the transverse part and leaves only the longitudinal part however we know that the longitudinal and transverse parts are equal at p square equals zero and so we can also use that to extract information on the transverse gauge boson self energy okay so we have that and the third one um, is here it also starts with the same dai of p square which uh, corresponds to spontaneous symmetry breaking then we have the scalar self energy matrix and then we have again the dac times the p mu and we also have the other object which is times p mu so overall we get plus p square explicitly as a prefector times dac of p square times this gamma h a j c of p square and so here you have it these are our three slavnov taylor identities in simplified form they all begin in the same way you have these d symbols which correspond to either spontaneous symmetry breaking or not so they are absent if we have unbroken symmetry they are non-zero if we have broken symmetry and they multiply certain self energies for example the scalar self energy or some strange mixing self energies which we are actually not so much interested in and then it goes on so this constrains the gauge boson self energy this constrains the ghost self energy and uh, this constrains the Higgs self energy so we can extract information on all the relevant quantities from these identities and let us do that now step by step okay so let us first study the unbroken symmetries so the gauge group might not be completely broken such as in the standard model we have a remaining qed gauge invariance which is unbroken by the vacuum and so let us assume here that there is a generator a with d a i equal zero then this symmetry is unbroken and that might correspond to the photon in the standard model for example 
And from that condition, we will now derive some consequences. So in those three identities, the first term is always zero and only the other terms remain. So what can we learn from identity one at momentum equal to zero? So from identity one at momentum equal zero, we learn the first term is completely zero because the d is zero, p is zero, therefore that is also zero, and then that must be zero. That is the gauge boson self-energy. So we get zero is equal to gamma C A C bar B at momentum equal zero. And that is true for all B, because A was fixed, but B was just an arbitrary index. What does it mean? If you have a matrix where for this index and for all B, that uh, matrix element is zero, it means the matrix has a zero determinant or a zero eigenvector. And therefore, at momentum equals zero, the determinant of this matrix vanishes. Uh, and what is the inverse of that thing? It doesn't exist, but it would be the propagator. So it means the propagator of the ghosts has a pole at p square equals zero. That means there is a massless ghost. And uh, which ghost is massless? This one with index A. So C A is a massless ghost. So we have proven, and this is an all order proof, that for an unbroken symmetry, the corresponding for the F-Popov ghost is massless. Nice, even though not yet physical, because the ghost is not physical. But anyway, we have derived it. Let us look at the second identity at momentum equals zero. The second identity, the first term is zero because of D, not spontaneously broken. Therefore, the second term must be zero. This contains the DAC, capital DAC, which is a matrix in color space times uh, the matrix of longitudinal gauge bosons. Let's write it down first. Zero is equal to DAC at P square equals zero times gamma longitudinal uh, BC at P square equals zero. So we have established that at P square equals zero, it's not written anymore, the longitudinal and transverse uh, gauge bosons are equal. Therefore, this also applies for the transverse gamma. And this is a matrix, an all order matrix, but at three level, it is chronic or delta. Therefore, at least in perturbation theory, uh, it will always be an invertible matrix. Non-perturbatively, we might not know, but in perturbation theory, this is invertible. Because at three level, it's chronic or delta. And so therefore, if we have an invertible matrix times another matrix gives zero, then that matrix, of course, also has a zero eigenvalue. And so we have a massless vector boson, and not only longitudinal, but also transverse. So a physical massless gauge boson. So we have a zero eigenvalue of gamma transverse AB at zero, and therefore a massless physical transverse vector boson. And here you see, for example, at all orders, you don't know actually um, 
which index corresponds to the massless gauge boson because that matrix here might be non-trivial. It doesn't have to be the unit matrix at all orders. And so uh, that corresponds to this mixing between the photon and the Z boson where at all orders you have to renormalize or redefine the mixing between the two such that the photon field operator in the theory really corresponds to the massless gauge boson. In general, you have just some linear combination between fields which correspond to the appropriate particle. But what is definitely established is the massless physical particle state with spin one and mass equal zero. And that is a very important physical consequence coming from the unbroken symmetry. And now let us do in a similar way the discussion of the broken symmetry. So let us now assume that the rank of this matrix DAI at zero is some number in broken generators. And let us for simplicity redefine the fields to basically diagonalize that matrix such that DAI at zero is non-zero for a equal one up to that number in broken and zero for a bigger than that number. So we have really uh, sorted the generators according to broken and unbroken symmetries and that is not a loss of generality, it just means that we take some suitable linear combinations. That might not always be practical in a concrete calculation but for the theory discussion we can definitely do that. And then of course now consider the broken case A uh, being one of the broken generators. Then let me actually begin by writing down some ideas that we have and that you already know of course. What are the ideas? We expect that for the broken generators the following things happen. First of all, the gauge bosons become massive. So we get physical transverse uh, massive vector bosons. Second, the massless goldstone bosons become unphysical. Um, so first of all they exist and uh, third they become unphysical. Um, let, okay here I have a different order so we get also a mixing as you know from the arc psi gauge discussion mixing between the gold stones and uh, the gauge fields and because of that it is actually not enough to say that if you have a massless um, goldstone self energy uh, that that corresponds to a pole in the propagator because of the mixing. And so anyway, let me now write the unphysical poles in the ghost, goldstone and uh, longitudinal gauge boson propagators. They must cancel each other out in the calculation of Feynman diagrams and that must mean that they are located at the same p-square values, so they are at the same positions. They coincide. So these are four expectations and let us prove them all in the remaining time. My question is whether we still need, probably we only need the right hand side of that blackboard. Okay, uh, which identity should we look at first? Let us look at the third identity. Maybe here. So 
Clough no Taylor identity three. What do we see? If we have a broken generator, then DAI is non-zero by definition. It multiplies the scalar self-energies. And here we have an additional term and the sum of the two gives zero. The additional term uh, starts with p square times some other regular objects. Therefore, uh, we might not know much about this, but what we know is at p square equals zero, that vanishes. Therefore, we can evaluate the equation at p square equals zero, and then we obtain that this annihilates the scalar self-energy matrix, which corresponds to a massless goldstone. But not really, because the goldstones can mix with uh, B fields and A fields and so on. But anyway, this has the same property as in the case of a global symmetry. It's just not that it means the same thing, but it has the same formal property, namely it is annihilated by the same vector as in the previous case. So the first thing is zero is equal to D A I at zero times gamma H J H I at p square equals zero. That's it, uh, as simple as that. And therefore, we see that there is a mass, uh, or a, let's say I would even say would be massless would be Goldstone boson. So we have already established one of our ideas that we had in mind. And why do I call it would be massless? Because this thing is not the inverse of a propagator matrix. It is not, because there is a mixing going on, and so the full propagator is a matrix between all boson fields, and uh, that matrix is a block matrix. It contains this block, but it also contains the mixing block between B and H, between B and B, between B and A, and all these blocks appear, and we should invert the whole block matrix. And uh, the inversion of a block matrix does not correspond to inverting the individual blocks. So that block does not have an inverse, but the entire block matrix might very well have an inverse, and therefore this does not guarantee that there is a massless propagator in our theory, physical or unphysical. We just don't know. We only know this. And uh, this corresponds to this would be massless, would be Goldstone boson. Anyway, the formal property of this object is exactly the same as in the case without local gauge invariance. This is what we can say. Let us go on and extract further consequences from identity three. Namely, if we write it down uh, once again, so zero is equal to D A I. Um, how can we say? Times gamma H J H I plus P square D A C gamma H A J B. Now at arbitrary momenta, then uh, we already saw that the mass term cannot contribute here. Because that is what we have just established. So in this product, the mass term drops out. Uh, therefore, only the kinetic term can contribute. And we have already mentioned that at least at three level, we know what the kinetic term is. So therefore, this is equal to p square times Kronecker delta ij plus higher orders. Okay, and so at least we know something at three level. And uh, at three level, this was also a Kronecker delta, Kronecker delta AC plus higher orders. And therefore, we can at least establish a three level relationship, namely the P square would then cancel. And we get that uh, DA times Kronecker delta is simply that gamma HA. So we get an information on this uh, maybe unimportant looking object. 
So we get here 0 is equal to d a i plus gamma h a uh, i a at p square equals 0 um, at 3 level. And uh, okay, that tells us that this object is the negative of this d a i which is interesting because that was the parameter measuring the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Then we can go into the slavnov taylor identity 2 here and plug in our knowledge. We have just learned something about this object. This object is minus DAI. And actually, so therefore you get here DAI times itself only with a different index, different index AB, minus that thing here. Therefore, we obtain 0 is equal to minus DAI DBI uh, minus gamma longitudinal BC at P equal 0, also at 3 level where I also used that uh, the DAC at three level is a Kronecker delta. And what do you now see? You see exactly the mass matrix for the gauge bosons at three level as we discussed them in the standard model lecture. That is exactly the structure of the gauge boson mass matrix. And again, this is equal to the transverse um, mass matrix. And so therefore, we get a three level mass matrix m square a b is equal to d a i d b i summed over i for the transverse gauge bosons. And so since uh, for uh, our, co uh, let's say, considered generators a and b, these d's are non-zero, so we get here a matrix with non-zero eigenvalues, and so we really have massive gauge bosons at three level. So we have massive physical gauge bosons. And so here you see as an example that we cannot establish an all-order expression for the masses but at three level they are non-zero, and so at higher orders there will be corrections, but in perturbation theory there is no way that a correction can drive the mass from non-zero to a zero value. But here the, there is no non-perturbative, or uh, let's say not even an all-order perturbative expression for the mass beyond uh, the slavnov taylor identity. I mean, that is an expression, but it's not a direct evaluation of the mass. But at three level we can do it. So that is nice. And let us now do the final step, namely discuss the unphysical sector. Um, so these are physical consequences. And let us now consider the unphysical sector, uh, where again these ma would be massless, would be goldstone bosons appear, and where we consider that mixing that I alluded to. And then we discuss the cancellation of the unphysical poles of unphysical propagators. Um, between ghosts and unphysical bosons. Can I delete already this, or do you need this? Uh, maybe we can also delete that one here. Let us look at the unphysical sector. And first consider the bosons. The following bosons exist, scalars, longitudinal vector bosons, and auxiliary fields B. And they can all mix with, with each other. And among the scalars, some of them are physical, some of them are unphysical, and uh, we have no way at this point to determine which is which. But anyway, in principle, all scalars can mix with the other bosons. So therefore, let us write down 
a kind of self-energy matrix or a two-point function matrix for the bosons, gamma boson, which is the following three by three block matrix. It starts here with a Higgs or a scalars, gamma h i h j. And uh, then let me show you the structure first. A mu A, A nu B. And then here in the final diagonal we have B A prime, B B prime. And so it is a block matrix between uh, all the possibilities of mixing between those particles. So here in that entry we have Higgs I uh, mixing with everything. So H I mixing with A B nu and then Higgs I mixing with B B prime. Then here we have A mu A mixing with everything. So here first mixing with Hj, then with A, and then with B. Okay, so and then in the third column we start with B A prime and mix it with everything. So first with Hj, then B A prime with A nu B, and then B with B. And so here we have this three by three block matrix. And that is the bosonic block matrix, and the inverse of that would be the full matrix of propagators between all those fields. I mean, we have in general established that uh, gamma uh, two point to the minus one uh, corresponds to the propagators. And so here we have many propagators, and uh, usually you might be used to the fact where everything is diagonal, and then you have just one gamma for one field and one particle. Its inverse is the propagator. But it works in a matrix sense, And here, not only in a matrix sense for the scalar matrix, which would be sufficient in the global symmetry case, that is what I said before, but we have to invert the entire block matrix. And the fact that this has a zero eigenvalue tells you nothing about uh, the fact whether this whole thing has a zero eigenvalue or not. That is what we need. And let me simply say the following. So if the determinant of this a bosonic matrix at some p star value is zero, then it means that the propagators have some pole at uh, this very momentum. p star square is a pole in um, the propagator matrix. between these bosons. Okay. And I mean, this is completely general. It, this would even be true if there were no mixing. So if all the off-diagonal elements are non-zero, then the general statement still remains true. But in our case, actually, the off-diagonal elements must be non-zero, as, for example, the Slavnov-Taylor identity tells us. So this is the unphysical boson sector. And then there is an unphysical ghost sector. And here we simply start by assuming that we have a mass of a ghost. So let P star square equal some ghost mass square. We assume it to be non-zero, be uh, zero of the determinant of the ghost mass matrix or ghost self-energy matrix at P star. Okay. So the determinant of that vanishes. So the ghost propagator has a pole at this value of P square. Then uh, what does it mean? It means literally that the matrix here of the ghosts have an eigenvector Uh, with eigenvalue zero, so that means there exists some vector, let's call it xd, which is non-zero, such that xd multiplied with gamma cd c bar b at this particular value p star vanishes. That is what it means. Determinant vanishes, therefore there exists such an eigenvector. 
and the eigenvector is of course not completely zero. Okay. Not. No questions. Determinant eigenvector. Somehow I see in your eyes that you are not convinced. Are you convinced? Oh, okay. If we have this eigenvector, we now start with um, so we we start with a physical uh, statement that we have a ghost mass, m ghost square. That gives us this eigenvector, and now we construct something. We construct the following vector, namely, let's call it y equal xd, xd contracted with the following gamma cd k hj gamma c, d, k, a, b, nu, zero. We construct that. So we multiply it with some appropriate uh, two-point functions. And uh, we ask, is this vector y, so it's a vector in the space of fields in the space of exactly these bosonic fields. It's a vector which has components hj, a, b, nu, and then that would correspond to components 4b. So this is a vector uh, that has exactly a structure such that you can multiply that matrix with a vector y. That makes sense. It has exactly the same block structure. Question, is this vector zero or not? Do we know this? x is non-zero, but if we multiply with this, do we get something zero or not? So you have to know whether these gammas here uh, are definitely non-zero or whether they could be zero. For example, the first one means our D, these uh, um, measures of spontaneous symmetry breaking, so we assume that some of them are non-zero. But maybe the contraction with the X maps them to zero. That is not obviously impossible. How about this one? What is that? What do you know about this? We talked about it earlier. So it was this object which at three level is simply Kronecker delta times P mu. Because that corresponds to the BRS transformation of the ghost, which is just derivative of the ghost. So that is P mu times Kronecker delta. If something is Kronecker delta at three level, it's automatically an invertible matrix at all orders. Therefore, here we have an invertible matrix times xd must give non-zero because it's invertible and x is non-zero. That is proportional to p, uh, but luckily we have assumed that the ghost mass is non-zero, therefore p is definitely non-zero. So that is non-zero since this is invertible. Then, gamma bosonic times y. What is this? We now take the product of this huge block matrix times that vector. So we multiply this with the first object, that with the second object, and the third with zero. What do you obtain? by this multiplication. You can look at the upper blackboard and compare. So 
you get product this matrix times that plus this matrix times that. Where does this appear on the upper blackboard? Unfortunately, we had introduced our abbreviations. Maybe, uh, okay, maybe not copy this, but uh, up to prefectors, this is DAI, and up to prefectors, this was D, uh, D, I, D, D, B. Okay, up to prefectors. And where do you see the combination small d times that plus capital D times that? Where do you see it? The third identity. And the third identity tells us precisely that this times this plus this times the other gives zero. And if you look at the prefactors, then they are exactly correct, such that y times this in the first row gives zero because of Slavnov Taylor identity number three. What happens in the second row if you multiply these three with that? So that is multiplied with small d. This is multiplied with capital D. Where does that appear? In the second Slavnov Taylor identity. And of course, the prefactors match such that you get exactly zero. What happens in the third row if you multiply this row with that here? Do you see this also? Probably not difficult to guess where you might see it, but do you actually see it? <laughs> but there is a catch to it, or a slight difference. What is the subtle difference? So of course it's Slavnov Taylor identity number one, where that appears small d times this plus capital D times that. However, the Slavnov Taylor identity contains something else. What is the something else? It is the ghost self energy. So that ghost self energy will now be multiplied uh, in this product with x. And the ghost self energy times x gives zero. Therefore, it doesn't contribute. And so for this reason, the Slavnov Taylor identity again tells us that this times that gives zero. And so, long story short, this is what we get. And in words, we can simply memorize uh, the first row follows from Slavnov Taylor identity three, second row follows from Slavnov Taylor identity two, and the third row follows from identity one plus xd times gamma c c bar equal zero. What does this equation tell us now? It tells us that uh, for P equal P star, the boson self-energy matrix is not invertible. Therefore, the boson propagators at this momentum have a pole. That is exactly the statement that the poles coincide between the ghosts and the unphysical bosons. So let's write this conclusion at P star square equal m ghost square is also a pole of the mixed propagators between the unphysical bosons.
And so you see, for example, explicitly in the RxI gauge fixing in the standard model, where the longitudinal vector bosons and uh, the ghosts and the would be Goldstone bosons all are massive, and the mass is related to the gauge boson mass by the gauge fixing parameter. So, uh, uh, but first, let's say that means the unphysical poles can cancel in physical S matrix elements. And so that is a, of course, necessary condition for uh, the independence of the gauge fixing parameter, for example. And so let me just add in RxI gauge fixing, for example, the longitudinal W plus minus and the Goldstone boson G plus minus and the ghosts C plus minus all have a mass Xi W times MW square. So they have a gauge dependent pole, but the pole is the same for all of them. And then the ghost loops come with a minus, and so there is a chance of this cancellation from happening. Very well. We are very good on time, so we can finish now. Let me just finish with a small outlook. So this finishes our treatment of spontaneous symmetry breaking, and in the next lecture we will do another topic. But uh, you can say in principle more to spontaneous symmetry breaking and I would refer you to the standard model lecture for more details on physical applications like in the standard model. In particular, uh, two things are noteworthy in this more formal context. One is what we discussed in the standard model already, namely the BRST structure. Um, of the theory with spontaneous symmetry breaking is um, interesting and we get uh, from the BRST transformation laws information on the physical and unphysical states. And so uh, looking at the structure, we automatically obtain the information that the massive gauge bosons have three physical degrees of freedom. The Goldstone bosons and the fourth degree of freedom for the gauge boson and the um, ghosts, they form a BRST quartet and so they are all unphysical and so the BRST structure matches with our intuition and the knowledge from simple tree level calculations. And the BRST structure uh, can be evaluated not only at tree level but also at all orders. And then exactly this discussion that we are doing here uh, tells us the all order information that we need to know in order to uh, determine the uh, linearized BRST transformations of all the fields um, in the full theory at all orders. And uh, then we can determine the physical and unphysical degrees of freedom in the same way. And uh, these consequences here, uh, they are of course all order consequences to establish the physical meaning of the theory. The other remark which I want to make is uh, there is the so-called Goldstone boson equivalence theorem, which is an interesting statement between physical um, uh, processes, physical cross-sections for longitudinally polarized physical gauge bosons on the one hand and on the other hand amplitudes with unphysical Goldstone bosons. So they become equal in the high energy limit and uh, Goldstone bosons even though they are unphysical can be calculated more easily because they are scalars and so that gives a simplification for certain calculations and the proof of this Goldstone boson equivalence theorem can also be done using similar methods as the ones that we have applied here. So just that you notice as well. Question? Sorry, so what you just said, is this the um, explanation why some people say that the Goldstone bosons in the standard model go into this longitudinal LA boson model? It has to do with it, even though it's maybe not exactly the same statement uh, that sort of statement is uh, what you see in direct explicit three level calculations which we have not done here but they would be easy to see in the standard model lecture where you 
at one point derive those mixing terms and where you see that uh, from um, the kinetic terms of the theory you at some point end up with um, something like this where you get a combination gauge boson plus uh, charge times some prefactor times uh, d mu of a goldstone boson. And so you see that precisely this linear combination is what appears in the Lagrangian. And that shows you on the one hand that the goldstone bosons can be absorbed into the gauge bosons by some gauge transformation, which leads to unitary gauge. But it also tells you that the goldstone bosons are um, immediately unphysical because they only appear in this combination. They do not appear alone and in isolated form. They only appear in this combination together with the gauge field. And since they become unphysical, you can use this sort of appearance to argue in this way that the Goldstone bosons are absorbed by the gauge bosons and give them the additional third physical degree of freedom. And yeah. OK, let's stop here. There is another interesting lecture that I want to attend. And so I'll see you next time.